Um, I think I will start this uh, session. So week uh, plenary um, for the ECPR virtual method school. And I'm really happy that we have uh, three uh, scholars who will be talking a little bit about their experiences coming from also different perspectives on methodological traditions uh, about getting published, uh, tricks of the trade. Um, of course, to get published, your work has to be, uh, have a relatively high quality. Um, but beyond that, of course, there's a lot of, you know, we know this from, from, from the rest of the world, you know, there's, uh, many products that never get sold, even though they're wonderful products. Uh, so, so how do we, how do we get our quality work out there? And the three uh, scholars will, will tell us a little bit. Um, I will let them uh, present themselves as far as the, the background, uh, but just uh, pointing out on the, on the screen here, we have uh, Kai Wilkinson, uh, Ingo Wolfing and Gabor uh, Simovitz uh, will be uh, speaking to you on this topic. And I really look forward to hearing what they say. Um, they will give uh, sh some, some comments and, and, or, and, and discussion points and, and, and um, tips. And then there will be plenty of time also for you to uh, also ask questions. Uh, so please either uh, raise your hand um, or uh, write in the chat. Uh, you can also uh, put a question uh, there that then I would uh, give to one or all of the, um, the participants. So uh, with that, I think I'll just take uh, in alphabetical order. So Kai, do you want to? Okay, thank you, Derek. Um, yes, I'm as an interpretivist or area studies person, I'm more used to going last. Um, so I think I'll probably start off with more of the general comments and then I'm sure Ingo and Gabor will talk about the, the more mainstream end of the discipline. Um, reflecting on my experiences, I mean, I think the first thing I've got to say is that unlike some people, and certainly I've, I've heard people where I thought, oh, I wish I knew that before, a lot of it has been about taking the opportunities that come up at the time um, and not being afraid to give it a go. So within journal publications certainly initially it was that idea of got to get one out but went with the topic that felt right for me and then found the good journal fit so in my case it was a very obvious one because i was writing about securitization theory so security dialogue was at least until this year for those of you who know the field um the journal that was going to take on securitization theory and it made it a logical fit so that was the easy starting point but beyond that it then became more of a generative process of that article led to other articles led to other publications and very much about networking through the field so i think probably in that sense it was not as deliberate as it could have been and i'm sure ingo and gabble will will give you more on the strategy side of it in terms of publishing more interpretivist work or work that is often seen as outside the mainstream. I think two things have been particularly helpful. Firstly is going where the conversations are happening. So not consistently trying to publish a piece of work that is outside of the, the area. So in my case, it's been feminist IR, critical security studies, and finding the locations where the people who you want to talk to are already engaging. So rather than prioritizing and saying, I've got to be with a, a Q1 journal, a lot of them increasingly are, but we are seeing long-term changes. So International Journal of Feminist Politics, for example, has moved up the impact ratings and moved up the, the, the overall rankings very quickly. So it does change and it does pay to go where you, the conversations currently are. Um, do still be critical because it does still matter, particularly for early career and for the opportunities you're that you'll encounter, but follow it through. The second strategy has also been creating my own opportunities. So looking for other like-minded scholars or the people whom I'd like to be talking to, and then looking at intervention sections, special issues, um, book projects. I know certainly many people would say that book chapters are where good ideas go to die. 
Um, but they are also a good way to get things out. And particularly when there are such uncertainties about publishing, it can be very helpful to have the space of a book chapter and to know that you can situate your work within a, a wider conversation rather than having to go get everything into a single journal article. Um, probably the only other issue I'll mention now before handing over is it is in some ways becoming harder to publish interpretivist work, but it makes it even more important to network. We've seen increasing moves towards data transparency initiatives, towards the idea that we should be open science, as it were, and that does cause problems in terms of the confidentiality, the ethical issues of opening up all our data, if indeed it's possible. Um, and on that one, I don't think we've been good enough yet at educating people on how to read our work on what the debates are. So rather than feeling defensive about it, rather than feeling as though we're being marginalized, I think we can be far more robust in our comebacks and in saying, we know our work is of value. We're trying to do something different. So let's help people understand that. Um, and increasingly there is a body of work that can be drawn on as that, that shield that uh, rather than having to start from scratch over and over again. So I'm not going to say it's easy, but I think we can be more courageous than we currently have been on that one. So, and if people want to talk about that further, I'll be very happy to pick it up. Okay, thank you. Uh, then I will give the floor to Gabor. So if you present yourself and um, then share your reflections. Thank you. Hi, <clears throat> so thanks for having me. Um, I'm uh, Gabor and I'm a recent graduate uh, from New York University. I'm, not, I'm working at CEU. So Levi was kind enough to invite me to this, to this panel. Um, and I work, I, I would imagine I'm, I'm working at the, kind of the opposite of the spectrum from Kai, I work mostly on uh, experiments and um, quantitative methods in in general. Um, so I, I wanted to. So I, I wrote down a few things, and uh, I'm not sure if if we are gonna get like more specific questions, but I just wanted to share <clears throat> some some thoughts that I had about uh, about publishing, uh, and I wanted to start with uh, with just a very general point. So I think a lot of people say that, um, you know, publication is, <clears throat> is, is getting very competitive and, uh, you know, people are, are being too obsessed about how much they, they get cited and how much they get published and so on. And I think there is a, a lot of truth in this, but I also want to stress that if you don't publish stuff, then no one is reading your work. So I, I guess the point is that <clears throat> publication shouldn't be seen only as something instrumental that's important in and of itself, should be seen as a way of uh, getting your voice heard. And then if you, you know, like if anyone doesn't have that motivation, then it's probably uh, a, a tough place to be as a, as a scholar. Um, I wanted to say a few things about the different uh, steps of um, publishing. Sorry, just we are home officing with my my spouse, and it's a bit tough. So, uh, <clears throat> so first I started. I wanted to start with topics. I think like one of the the key things with identifying topics uh, is that you need to identify puzzles. And uh, so I think that most most good work um, originates from identifying some puzzle in the real world that others haven't been able to explain. So I think that that's, uh, that's just one of the scenic one on for writing good papers. Um, and also <clears throat> when you identify a puzzle, you need to somehow tie it into some existing discourse in your, in your field. So I think that these are the two key elements that are super important. Uh, I wanted to say a few things about writing in general that I thought were important. Um, so I think that the most important thing here is that, which I think a lot of uh, people miss when writing papers, is that they write 
about political science rather than writing about politics. And I think that even though a lot of the time, you know, the literatures can get very much uh, lost within themselves, I think that people in the, you know, in, 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 the, in the depth of their heart, they realize that interesting stuff is to study the world rather than to study each other. Um, so like just little, like smaller points, I think it's, extremely important to learn how to write good introductions because a lot of the times people who read your work including referees only read your intro and then decide if they want to carry on and relatedly it's it's important to learn how to be concise i'm sure it's 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 different between um you know like more empirical scholars and uh, interpretivist but I, I when i review papers i i, I get the feel that uh People, people often don't know where to stop and don't revise their work enough. Um, yeah, I think this is what I wanted to say about like this, this first stage of the process. And I have some notes about, you know, strategizing about where to send papers, uh, how to deal with rejections and uh, how to revise papers. I'm also happy to talk about my, you know, my own experience, but I wanted to just these, these were the things that I definitely wanted to mention. And if, if, if these topics come up, I'm happy to share my views. Thanks. OK, thank you, Gabor. And uh, last but not least, uh, Ingo. Uh, so do you want to present yourself and then um, share your reflections? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Derek. And thanks for having me on the panel. Um, so I'm working on, on methods, uh, mostly qualitative methods, and that's where I have my own publishing experience from. But I've also been editor for three and a half years where I dealt with different journals and some of the, the experience also comes uh, from this. So I don't know what the participants' um, experience is already with publishing, but I mean, it has to be said once, I think. So publishing is frustrating. Yeah, it's very often frustrating. It takes a lot of time. It's hard to plan. And when you are on the peer review process, you are unlikely to get your manuscript uh, accepted uh, with the first submission and maybe not even the second or the third one. Sometimes you get mean or superficial reviewer comments and you think they haven't read your manuscript thoroughly, which is probably true very often. Um, but that's the way it is. And everybody knows it. But uh, this is the, the field in which you have to to, to navigate. So this is what you have to prepare for. And uh, I think it's always a good idea. Uh, I would say it helps to talk to other people uh, in order not to get the impression that you are the only one who's having or probably is having then a hard time. Yeah, so in general, when you look at, at or talk about publishing, it's difficult to, to infer something from what is happening because you only see what is getting published most of the time and who's getting published where. But on Twitter, for example, uh, you sometimes see people who publish an article in, say, I don't know, West European politics, which I would say is a very good journal. Then you think, well, again, West European politics for them. But then they say this has been the seventh or eighth submission and it has been on their table for 10 years. You know, th this, this happens. Yeah. Still, it's West European politics. It looks good on the CV but it also has been a long process or might have been a long process for them. And no one has, I think no one has good data on this, but so there is maybe the urban legend, but the word is it takes about three to four submissions on average to get your article published. Some people might be better, might have better networks. Some people might take more often, but it's a very long run process and uh, it helps to talk to someone when you get reviewer comments, you might be mean which can happen, as I say. So this is something on, on handling this and, and preparing your mindset for publishing. And the tricks of the trades, I mean, um, you also get from this. So I mean, we all get published in different venues and I'm sure you, if you stay in academia, you will also get published in good journals. Um, but no one really knows how to get published because it's that erratic or stochastic or however. So it's very unreliable process. Um, you can only increase your chances, uh, this is similar to what I think Galvar said before, so you need to improve your writing, you should also take writing courses if you can, 
maybe only one day, but it helps give your manuscripts to, to your friends or colleagues to get comments before you submit, because at some point you are blind to certain aspects and then have fresh perspective. This will also help to improve your manuscript, but in the end, it depends on two to four people, reviewers, and what they think about the manuscript. Maybe some uh, smaller comments, uh, maybe not important right now, but at a later point. So for example, cover letters, it's also something which comes up on Twitter again. Don't spend much time on the cover letters because most editors, I think, don't read them. And even if they do, they don't mean anything in the end. And so if you say, I have terrific research here and it fits into your journal for whatever reason, it doesn't matter if the reviewers don't like your paper and if the editors don't like your paper. Yeah. Two lines in a, in a cover letter usually are also enough and you can spend, save your time for something better than the cover letter. So publishing, um, and Kai, Kai um, already hinted at this, um, it's not only, I would say, anymore getting your article <coughs> into a journal or published somewhere. The transparency part is something which comes formally after the publishing of the article or the acceptance, but you also have to be prepared depending on the, the field in which you are and the method that you use, that you have to spend time and resources on getting your material online. So publishing is also working on a transparency appendix or your reproduction material. It's not only getting the article out, and the sooner you start working on your material that you have to share, in particular when you work with quantitative methods, the better because the less work it is once you get accepted. So it's always important to think ahead. Uh, and one thing where you have to think at is, uh, I have to share, I should share material once, and I need to keep it in order. And there's also a lot of material on this, how to make good reproduction material in R or Stata, but you have to keep this in mind. Something else uh, which you might wonder about is preprints. So should I post papers online before I submit them to a journal? So I think formally in political science, it's not a problem. So I don't know any journal except for old German experiences, but I don't know any journal that rejected um, a submission for peer review because it has been posted online somewhere. And so formally, you shouldn't be in any trouble. The question is, do you want to share your work before it has been get, gotten the formal peer review stamp and it, before it got published? So I would say it's, good, it's a good idea to increase your visibility early in the, in the process and to also signal to your community or to whomever um, that you have something which can be read and you can also hope to get comments on a preprint that you might include then before you submit it to a journal. The concern is, I think very often that uh, your idea is getting stolen. Yeah, so this happened. Uh, I also know not from myself, but from a friend that it happened. Not that data is stolen and that the entire paper is stolen, but the idea that you have or a clever research design that you have then might be something that someone else picks up in his or her own paper without giving you a credit for it. So this is where you have to make your choice uh, whether you want to be visible early or whether you want to minimize the risk of getting stolen. But I would suggest you should put emphasis on getting um, attention for your work. And I would say the risk of, of uh, people stealing something from your, your paper is very small. Yeah. But it's there and it's a legitimate concern, but I think it's not worth, uh, it's not outweighing the risks. Uh, another thing, once you get to the point of publishing, um, it's not something that I really like, but there's so many papers out there. So you also need to get increased attention for your paper, even if it got published. And so getting published is not enough anymore. I think on a blog, they once call it, you have to, uh, you have to do marketing, you have to advertise your paper. What you might also think about is to have then at some point a blog, so that you create a blog on your own website. Uh, I have one, so you don't have to read it. Uh, it's not why I'm mentioning this, but I have one. And it's also good for just putting small ideas out uh, that I don't want to put in an article. It's another thing that 
I might want to share, say here. So not every idea that you have has to be an article, although publishing is of course important for the career, but sometimes a nice short blog post is doing as well. And again, if you advertise a blog post then on Twitter or in your department or somewhere else, this is also giving you attention and visibility, which might then help in other ways. And blogs are much faster to write and they have lower standards in terms of referencing. That's something that I like. So blogging is, I think, a nice complement to formal publishing, but also supplementary, because once you have a paper out, you can also advertise it on your blog and write a more accessible version of the paper. Okay, so there's of course many more to say about how to choose uh, among journals, uh, where sh should you high, uh, aim high first or should you aim low? But this is something we can discuss in the QA and I would also then finish here and I'm as the others interested in your questions. All right. Um, so we have a uh, nice time for uh, questions. So this is your opportunity to ask about um, you know, three published uh, scholars of different traditions um, about some tri tricks and, and, and tips uh, that might be relevant for your own research. You might be in a dilemma yourself regarding exactly what kind of strategy you are thinking about using for that first article or et cetera. So, uh, please uh, just uh, raise your hand or put a question in the uh, chat function. Okay, so the floor is now open. And please don't feel shy. Of course, you have to unmute yourself, uh, please both camera and, and sound. Oh, people are shy. I think I'll ask maybe the first question as far as advice uh, to the panelists then uh, would be if you are a, a PhD student and you're doing an article model, um, what is your advice regarding the first article? How, how soon should you send it in? Um, you know, if you have three years, uh, can you wait two years to send that first article in? Uh, what would your recommendations be? Uh, again, of course, assuming that there is something that is getting to the point where it actually is publishable, but what would your recommendations be? So, any ref I can start then, uh, yeah. if no one else wants. Um, yeah, I mean, it depends on the, on the requirements of the uh, department, but I guess I hope that no department expects uh, articles to get accepted uh, for finishing the PhD. Um, so I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be uh, rushing, I wouldn't rush it. Um, so writing and writing good article and learning to write and structuring the article, uh, including the introduction, what Gabor said is this is something you need to learn. Um, as you need to learn other things still when you do your PhD. So to like Derek said, uh, maybe at the beginning of the last year, somewhere during the last year, this might be in general a good point for submitting the first article. But it depends, of course, on a couple of things. If you if your master, if your PhD thesis is an extension kind of of the master thesis, then you might have earlier material that you can submit because there's something you can build on. If you work in teams, uh, which is I think here in political science still less common than same psychology. But if you work in teams where you have division of labor, then it can also be sooner, of course, than submitting the first single authored article on a topic that you started working on um, on day one of your PhD. But I will also not wait too long uh, for the reason that I also mentioned, peer review takes time. So waiting too long can also backfire. So somewhere in the last third, Quarter of the PhD might be good, good period. Um, if I can add something, um, I think one other consideration is that, um, again, that's only from my experience, so I, I, it might not be applicable for for others. But I think that it's it's extremely unlikely that anyone is going to write an amazing article for the first try. 
And so I think um, if you if you do a PhD where you're required to write papers for courses, it, I think it's a it's a very good idea to try to submit some of your better term papers to lower tier journals simply because you learn a lot about the process. So so you know like you, you learn. Um, what a rejection letter looks like, you learn, uh, if you get lucky and you get a revise and resubmit, you learn uh, what kind of things uh, referees want you to do. And I think it's also, uh, it can be quite liberating in some sense when uh, you learn that maybe you wrote something that your advisor didn't like, but some other people did, or, or the other way around, maybe you are writing, working on a topic that uh, folks in your department uh, are fixated on, but but it turns out that that uh, you can't get it published because no one else cares about it. So I think it's it, it, on one hand, it's of course important <clears throat> uh, to 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 publish and try to publish in order to increase your chances of getting a job. But on the other hand, it, I think it's also a good uh, practice, and also it's a good it's a good way to get feedback, and it's also a good way to. Um, uh, kind of get a reality check of whether what you are working on is indeed interesting. Of course, it needs to be taken with a grain of salt. It, 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 as as the others said, it, it, it's extremely the, it's the extreme volatility to these uh, reviews that people will get. Um, at the same time, I think that the costs of uh, of submitting the paper to a journal is like super super low. So you so you compare it to what people, compared to the time people spend on just writing things, submitting a paper is, you know, like it takes a day in formatting. So I think it's, it's, it's always a good idea to, to at least try. And, um, and again, it, it, it could be a good, uh, it, it can also be a good occasion to, to aim very high. And then even if, even if it's very, very unlikely that you get something published in a top, in a top journal early on, um, Maybe you get valuable feedback. So I think that the the the, the returns are are pretty high uh, compared to the cost, for sure. Kai, do you have a? Yeah, I, I think a few comments. Me. My immediate answer to your question is when you've got something to say, um, <laughs> which is one of those frustrating ones, which you know may not be immediately evident. But I, I think working up to that that full peer-reviewed full-length article that's in the sort of journal where we all imagine getting published is it, it needs to be seen as part of a process so it's it's developing the ideas it's using the other publishing opportunities be that you know writing in some of the disciplinary blogs i mean certainly ir's got some very good ones including duck of minerva um disorder of things are the two that immediately come to mind um, it's also writing about different aspects of the problem. I mean, it may be writing about the methods, the fieldwork, the things that can happen there. Um, don't underestimate review articles. I mean, I think certainly one of the things I was encouraged to do by one of my colleagues and my department when I was a PhD student is review some of the books for your field, get published that way. You know, it doesn't count for much in the great scheme of building up that record, but it, it does get you used to the writing, to the engagement. It means you're more familiar with the field. Um, I, I'm cautious about the give it a go approach simply because reviewing the cost of the journal might not be high, but the amount of effort that goes into reviewing papers and the loss of goodwill that happens when a paper is basically a master's dissertation that has just been submitted. And I know there are some programs that have actually encouraged people to submit just as a way of getting feedback. Um, it, it's it can be counterproductive in the long term I mean, certainly this year with COVID it's been particularly bad I think in terms of reviewer availability I got six requests in a week recently so you know great that the northern hemisphere academic calendar is at that point where everyone tries to push stuff out but I can't accept six reviews and, um, and a lot of other people are going to be in that situation as well so there needs to be that recognition that Yes, it's worth trying, but it also needs to be not just submitting and submitting and submitting as a way to get feedback. It needs to be part of that bigger process. Um, and I suppose the other thing we haven't mentioned here is PhDs by publication, which means that you're going to have to start publishing sooner and about getting things out. 
um, simply because you need it for your PhD. And then the timelines can really feel quite tight. And you may need to be very flexible about where you publish and the sort of articles that publish. So have that overall idea of what your thesis is, what your topic is, but then be willing to address it in different ways. Yeah, thank you. And, and actually in, on the selling side or the, the, the you know, having something to say, as, a, as an experienced reviewer, it's typically, I would say, I pretty much know whether something's going to be accepted after the first page maybe page and a half. If I'm not sold, then they're really going to have to do a lot of heaving and shoving to, to really convince me that they have an argument. I mean, it, a good argument should be right up front uh, and, 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 and very easily understood. Uh, so even though you write your, your, your uh, conclusion or your, an introduction at, after you've already done the research, um, you should spend a lot of time uh, thinking about selling in the introduction. Okay, I can see I have a question. Uh, I can, uh, if you could unmute your, uh, I believe it's uh, Michael. So uh, if you would like to ask your question, thank you. Yes, uh, thanks to the panel uh, for the, your tips and expertise. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm Michael Zeller, I'm a PhD candidate at the Central European University's doctoral school uh, and just, to, I'd like to ask some of you to expand on uh, the development phase of, of your article manuscripts. Um, you know, you have a draft and you're looking to get good feedback before you uh, try and shape it up and submit it to a journal. Um, in my own experience, it's, it's been uh, sometimes relying on participants at a research seminar or uh, in, in some research networks um, or just asking advisors or friends to have a look who are at least in adjacent fields, if, if not in the same. Um, but I wondered if, if you have sort of a, a standard process that you go through uh, or, or particular opportunities that you look for when you're uh, trying to uh, develop a manuscript. I right, thank you for the question. Uh, which panelist would like to take a stab? I'll start us off if, if people want to. Um, I think a lot of the time, new ideas and putting it into a particular form, particularly for articles rather than books or longer projects, is conference calls. Um, and knowing that that's going to provide the structure to present those ideas, get some feedback from people who you might not usually have a conversation with just because of geographical distribution. Um, and also that it's going to force you to do something so that you don't disappoint your discussant. So a lot of the time it is about the conferences and about using that as a way to move things forward, getting that first draft from that, then revising it. And the best sort of feedback has been having that combination of swapping with someone, people who do know what you're writing about, but can still be critical. So exactly as you mentioned, the swapping papers with someone, sending it for informal review. Um, the other thing that tends to happen is it gets picked up, worked on, and then it gets put down for longer than you want it to. And on the one hand, that's frustrating, but on the other hand, it does give you a different perspective when you go back to it. You know, you're not quite as attached to it. You've got that perspective that lets you be a bit more brutal with yourself before you send it in. Uh, Ingo or Gabor? Uh, yeah, maybe uh, briefly on this and then also on the uh, question in the chat. Uh, I may pick it up. Um, I mean, the, the, so the big formats like in, in Europe, ECPR, general conference, joint sessions of workshops, they have follow regular schedule, the APSA and the APSA as well. Uh, so this is what you can, can plan for. Um, I mean, in general, so if I would have to give a recommendation where to apply to, and that's what I hear from many people, uh, but it might also be something like survivor bias, the joint sessions are really a good format, um, better than a conference, because you get together for, in non-corona times at least, with a group of people from your field for a couple of days, and it's really a workshop format, and this is where uh, many 
really established and uh, created a network and uh, established ties that lasted for years. So this is really uh, where something develops and grows out of. And it's different for conferences where if you have a conferences, you know that there might be only two people or five people or maybe even none in the audience. Yeah, so it's only the panel and no one else. So this can also happen. Um, but in general, you can try to plan for the conference. What I would not recommend to do is, and I'm still not good at following the advice myself, is not start not writing a paper uh, or propose a paper that you still have to write. And so in, in when you think in September, okay, I propose for the APSA uh, paper in January, and I still have the next year to write it. It doesn't work like this, at least not for me, and you always end up writing it in July and August. And this is then not the paper that you wanted to present. Yeah, so I know for PhD students, you have to get into this, this process and to, to get your, your pipeline full. Um, but at some point, uh, I would look for venues where you can present your paper, not for um, papers that you still have to, uh, to write and then look for venues where you can present it. And so it's better to give a pass on one conference and not to present something than to have to rush it in the end. Um, maybe one more comment on the language. Um, yeah, so if you're not a native speaker, then I would suggest that you um, have, a, um, have it proofread by um, a native speaker. Uh, first of all, then it, it reads better, first of all. And second, uh, sometimes reviewers comment on the language and it's probably the case even if they don't mention it, it's probably the case that they downgrade the, the submission if it's not in a good format, if they think it's not a native speaker. So I think it's none of the business of reviewers to judge the language, as long as it's clear what you're trying to say or what you're saying, but still some peer reviewers pay attention to this and it's good to make your paper appear as if it was by a native speaker. But can we also just on that one note that there's plenty of native speakers who will not pass the native speaker check. Um, so there yes. are, and particularly once we're talking about different Englishes and particularly the gap between European and North American Englishes, there are big differences there. So I think it's if you can afford it, then certainly it's worth getting checked by a professional. Um, but if you get someone else to do it and they're not qualified and that may be necessary. Get them to read for readability, don't get them to copy edit. Um, you want to know which bits are not clear and focus on that rather than having notionally perfect English. Um, I'm not sure there is such thing and it will vary hugely by, by field. Yeah, I think one, one thing I would add here, which is maybe like not direct related is that I think as, as long as people write um, empirical work, uh, I don't think it matters too much if you're a native speaker or not. I mean, obviously people should use spell checks and uh, try to like structure their, par don't write like page long paragraphs and, and things like that, which are most likely common to most languages. Um, but I think that the, the, the big mistake people make is that they are, they are writing in a too flowery way, and uh, if you if you I think if you if you just keep things simple and write, you know, like short sentences, you know, like four or five paragraph per page, and uh, don't use words that most English speakers don't understand, I think you're fine. And obviously, I I also try to as a non-native speaker, I also usually try to, or in the past, definitely, maybe not, not so much anymore, but I used to ask native speakers to, to read my stuff. Again, this is, I think, mostly true for the intro. And, uh, <clears throat> and then, you know, like every time I, uh, I get a paper, um, every time I get an R&R &R for a paper and the reviewers, you know, like give you a, a few points that, hey, you made a typo here, or they say that you should proofread your work again, and then you, you just do it. But I don't, I don't think that, um, I think unless, you know, people's writing is just clearly sloppy and wasn't spell checked, I don't think most reviewers um, 
um, you know, take credit from their intellectual contribution. So people definitely have these uh, implicit prejudices and uh, maybe fail to distinguish between the the content and the, you know, maybe like not perfect linguistics, but I don't think that's, I think that on the margin efforts should be allocated to, to the substance, not the, not the writing so much. Thank you. Uh, any questions? So, okay, uh, Madalena, I recognize you. Yes, hi. Thanks a lot for the talk um, and the opportunity to ask questions. I'm Magdalena, I'm a PhD at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. And my question would be when we only talk about where, how, to, how to submit and how to revise, uh, but what happens if your desk rejected? What do you do with the paper? I'm following on, on Twitter uh, dramatic posts about people having been accepted after seven rejections. And like it sounds very painful. How long would you clinch to your draft? And when do you let it go? Okay, thank you. Uh, panelists? Take a stab. Kai, do you want to start us out? Yep. Um, I think a lot of desk rejects are due to picking the wrong journal. Um, so you need to firstly go back, check the fit. You know, is this actually something that is reflecting the debates that are going on? Because if not, that's going to be an an easy desk project. It may also be a question of go back and actually look at it and say, have I articulated what this is actually about? In which case it's worth it. I know plenty of people who will also have their next journal lined up and fire it off almost immediately just for something to do. I think on the anyone can get at one desk project, if you're getting two or three, then it is time to slow down. But I would say don't necessarily ditch it, it may be you need more time to develop it, to revise it, to work out what's going on with the article. Um, certainly, you know, it does take time not only to get it accepted, but also to get it in a format where it's saying something that is publishable. So if you've done all the basics, then don't be in a rush to ditch it, but equally don't be in a, a rush to get, get it sent in again. Um, take the time to have a think about what's going it can just need a bit more time. Um, and in the meantime, I think this was the other comment is, learn about the process from the other side. If you can't, if you're not going to get a chance to review other people's articles directly, if you can shadow someone through it, and increasingly this is possible, you just need to get your supervisor or the person who you're shadowing to get permission from the editorial team. You will learn a huge amount by going through that process from the other side of taking an article apart, of reading what people are submitting, and then working out not only what's the problem with it, but how can you express that to them in a way that is going to help them improve the article? Um, what do you want them to do with it to make it publishable for that journal? So I think there's come at it from a variety of angles. Don't give up, but equally be realistic about sometimes needing that bit more time. Okay, thank you. Gabo? Um, so this is something I, I actually wanted to say in, 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 the, in the beginning. So I think that it's, I, I got like really tons of reviews and I think that basically the, the, the kind of critiques that you get can be put into like three different bins where one is that people say that what you wrote is just not interesting enough. The second one is when people say that it's not methodologically sound. So they just made a mistake. And then the third one is that it's not, it's not well written or it's not like the structure is unclear or it's, or, or it, it's kind of in between the two. Um, and I think that it's like these imply totally different things. So if, if you will say that your work is not interesting enough, then, uh, but they say that it's well written, they should just go down to a lower tier journal. Um, I think that it, to me, that happens less and less of the time because it's just, not because I'm writing better papers. It's just that I, I think I'm more critical of myself and I can uh, better judge 
like what would be the kind of the ceiling for a paper um if you will say that what you wrote is methodologically unsound then um i think a lot of the times you just you just find out that you were just wrong and i think those are the times when you just quit the project and i i mean i guess it, it could go different ways depending on your discipline but if you um so for instance, when you, so I, I do a lot of uh, survey work and you know, some people, maybe some people would say that what you were trying to measure with a survey question is measuring something different. So you're, you're not really able to identify the kind of construct that you are arguing for. And then it's, it can definitely happen that the reviewer just convince you that you are wrong. And then in, in, in those cases, maybe it's, there is nothing to do about it, sometimes you can still think that the, the reviewers were wrong. And, then, and in this case, you could just submit it to a similarly high level journal and then maybe uh, do some work on the, on the manuscript where you try to, um, you know, like put some extra effort to sell the part of the paper that the, the, the previous reviewers thought was, uh, was a weak spot, <clears throat> and then uh, and then and then the third one is when you, you you get the critique that you know like it's the the paper kind of has the ingredients, but it just um, not well written. So that basically means that it would require too much effort from you uh, to revise and get published. Then uh, you could just uh, rewrite it and uh, and try again. I think that's pretty much the, the best case scenario. Um, but yeah, I think that I think that again, it's really hard to stress uh, enough times that there is such a huge. Uh, so I guess the 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 noise in these reviewers' comments is much bigger than the the signal. So it's totally possible that you 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 get you get comments that say like, this is just not interesting enough, and then. Um, and then you you know like you submit to a, a an even higher ranked journal and then they just love it, so so I, I guess that there is there is like it, it, I think that's that's the tricky part that you need to like kind of update your beliefs about the merits of the paper but not too much and then I think that just takes a lot of experience. Okay, um, I'm going to take the next question and then I'll probably uh, Gabriel. A goblet, yeah. Yes, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I'm Gabriel Covinos University PhD student, and um, as a follow-up uh, question to what our professor just talked about, and in the initial comment by one of our speakers concerning that um, as a as a publisher, you should aim high, and connecting these two dots, I'm I'm wondering as a PhD student or as someone who wants to go the portfolio way, that is people way for dissertation as a start or as a beginning or to, to, to try to publish. How high should it aim? Uh, I just want to know the uh, expert view. How high should it aim the Q1, Q1? How should it be? And how should you go around this and see the best the best place to send your first paper or second and, and, and whatever, on combining these two uh, comments from our speakers? I'm just thinking about it. How should I aim to what extent? Thank you. Ingo, do you want to uh, kick us off? You can try, yeah. I mean, the, so the, if you say high, so we have uh, ranking in mind or the impact factor probably. So this shouldn't, this can be one criterion for making a journal choice, but uh, it shouldn't be the only one. Um, so this is what, what Gabo also said. And uh, so you, over time, it's important to get a feeling, and it's really just a feeling or experience, you might say, experience with what paper fits where. Um, so in terms of the field and also the, say, um, the ranking or quality or impact factor of the journal. So I know at least one person who is always going from top to bottom. Um, I don't know why, but I think it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, on the other hand, if you have time, if you have time, you don't care whether you get rejected five times before it gets accepted to sixth time, you can always start at the top. But I will also agree with Kai, what Kai said before, it's uh, on, a, on a 
it's a community level, it's a waste of resources. If you always go to the top journal, even if you know it's very unlikely to get accepted, even less likely than it already is, it's a waste of resources and one shouldn't do it. Um, so another, so, I mean, if you have this feeling, then you might have an idea when you want to go for AJPS or IO or whatever your feel is, or whether you want to go for, say, it's still a very fine journal comparatively in politics or so. So the second question is, um, and then it's related, whether you want to go for a journal journal or a field journal. And they should have the same readership, I would say, but very often they don't. And there's some people who say only read or the top five journals, they don't read party politics and people who read party politics don't read AJPS. And for some, uh, AJPS or APSR or IO doesn't also count that much. So, and this is in the second uh, um, thing dimension of the decision process. Do I want to address, say, my field researchers, party researchers, public administration researchers, or European Union researchers, whatever? Or do I want to aim at a general audience? And that's more or less maybe independent of the, the impact factor or the ranking. But in this say, coordinate system, I would try to make a choice based on the feeling of how good your chances are at what level of the ranking. And if you don't have a feeling or experience yet, then you, you should talk to people who have more experience, the supervisor, more senior colleagues who know the field and who know, probably know then what's a good fit for, for your paper is. Okay, uh, Kaya Gabo, do you have anything you want to share uh, additionally to this? Okay, uh, questions? Uh, maybe I'll, I'll as, a, as a chair just, uh, well, first I just wanted to um, ask whether you think this is a good idea. Maybe I'll throw this out. So one of the things we've actually started in my PhD program uh, is is to try and encourage uh, also, for example, PhD advisors and, and more senior scholars to share uh, reviews and review processes uh, with with their with their students um, to see you know a good article. It some sometimes it does take six rejections, and the rejections can be brutal. Um, maybe if you wanted to just to share uh, with us uh, one maybe very rewarding at the end, but very particularly brutal uh, example of an article you've had uh, that eventually got published, but, but um, what you did to get eventually published, even though you kept on bumping your head into the wall and, and not getting, you know, getting rejections. Um, or maybe it's only me that has that problem. <laughs> yeah. Any of the panelists want to share a little bit about a how, how they got a particularly difficult article uh, through? It's, uh, if I may start, it wasn't, I mean, it was difficult. It was party research. And uh, for one reviewer who was very clear in the review, then in the first round, it all mattered um, how you measure party ideology, so left, right, and what data set you used. Um, so the editor then in the end, say, played along or didn't put too much emphasis on the reviewer comment. Uh, but this is, I think, took two rounds then with arguments and additional empirical analysis to show that the measure that I used uh, worked fine. And then I don't remember exactly what the reviewer recommended in the end. Uh, but this was, uh, I think, the toughest experience, at least the one that I remember. Um, in general, one point maybe in relation with this, um, it depends a little bit, but peer review or the actual process and when you write your revision letter, it's not, it's not a discourse, it's not deliberation. As it's a symmetry between you and you at the lower end or at the weaker end of the symmetry and the viewers and the editors. So arguing against a position sometimes might be the most sensible thing, but not the best thing to do. Uh, because then the viewers can say, but they didn't respond or they didn't do anything about my comment. It's just this paragraph here. And then they continue to say reject your, your publication. 
So in general, I would say you have to go an extra mile if necessary and to do what the viewers say, even if you don't like what they request from you. And even if you think it makes your paper less coherent or a little bit worse, I mean, it's your decision in the end, but sometimes you have to uh, yeah, go the, the hard extra mile to get it through. All right, uh, Kai, any experiences with uh, particularly difficult and how you got through it? Um, I, I've been pretty fortunate mainly because a lot of the time I'm writing with special issues or with communities. I think one that comes to mind is an article that I ended up reviewing, I think three times. So, because the revise and resubmit. And, and that was one where they kept on trying to do what the reviewers were asking them to do but it, it was almost, it wasn't picking up how to do it in a way that revised the article rather than just keep on adding on bits. Um, and so I think part of that probably speaks to it. The temptation is always to just do the bare minimum or to think that you can work with what you've got. And rewriting needs to be a deeper process than that. I mean, yes, it's painful, but if you do it properly, it will take more time and it, it has got the best possible potential to improve the article. Um, if we just dally around the edges, that's when it does begin to look like you know, this terrible modded car that has got too many add-ons rather than staying streamlined and to the point. Yeah, or the, the Frankenstein article, which uh, yeah. yeah, just uh, turns into a monster. Yeah, so, uh, well, got, yeah sorry. Yeah. Be prepared to let let the first version go. It it does involve swallowing that sense of frustration that you know why have the reviewers asked you to do so much? And I think the final comment I'd make on that one is with the memo, it's okay to be pushed back on some points and say why you haven't done it, at least the first time round. But you need to give a compelling argument for why this hasn't been done, rather than it being this. Well, with respect, we don't like it. Yeah. And and sometimes the review, the the actual editor, a really good editor, will actually give you some nice clues about that because you sometimes reviewer two is just a, and 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 sometimes the editor will actually say, hey, basically, ignore reviewer two. Uh, so so when you're thinking about the asymmetry, the the person that you really need to follow is the is the editor. Uh, of course, you have to ha make the reviewers happy too, but there's you know, the review, the, at the end of the day, it's the editor uh, and maybe a board that, that, that accepts it. Uh, Gabor, do you want to uh, take us out here? Um, yeah, just a, <clears throat> just a sh short thing that, that we had. Um, it was, it was the, kind of the, the most bizarre path we had for a paper. We had a, an experiment we ran in the US, which was basically about whether people care how politicians justify positions that they take. And we, and we basically had like these really small results. So we, we, we were trying to say in the paper that, well, like it doesn't really matter how politicians justify, but we had like a, a big sample. So we had these significant findings nevertheless. And then we, get, we got these reviews repeatedly that we were basically doing these kind of fee hacking. So we were, intentionally, you know, like coming up with analyses that were in favor of our hypothesis. And then we were like, at the end, we were just submitted to a different journal and said like, this is just a null finding. We, we are not claiming anything. We, and you just emphasizing that our, our hypotheses were wrong and then it got published. But, but this, I think that this is a, a, a super frustrating thing that, that um, once you, once you once you come up with, uh, with with findings that don't you know don't comport with your predictions, it's kind of like tougher to to write a good paper. And then I think even though there is this movement now in in in, in some parts of political science that that uh, even null results should be published, I think reviewers are still having a, a tough time to to you know, like find the value in these papers and. Um, you know, so if you if you don't have like tons of time, maybe like these papers are better to to forget because it's just uh, the returns on 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 effort in these papers is just can be very small. And I had a I had a bunch of uh, quite quite frustrating experience with this, even though I thought that the the papers were pretty good 
and uh, the, the lack of findings was interesting, but uh, I think uh, reviewers are slow to adapt to it. And I totally agree. I think it's a super important point uh, that uh, that you need to you need to pay a lot of attention to to the way the editor frames the reviewer comments. And I just I just got like uh, a a few a few reviews where it's not even so 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 sometimes the editor simply says that they are not even sending it back to some of the reviewers, and they just say that. Uh, you know, like do what you can about these comments and I'll, I'll decide if I'm happy about them. So even that's a possibility. So yeah, thanks. Okay, uh, with that, and I think also the, the, a nice take home from, from what Gabor and the others were also saying is it's also a lot about framing. Uh, so sometimes you can have some really, actually really good result, research and results or maybe non-findings, but that are interesting. And uh, often it's, it can also just be a tweaking of really flagging what your contribution is. And sometimes uh, I've personally experienced um, just a little bit of a, a tweaking in the framing of an article it goes from uh, desk rejection to, well, revise and resubmit, but at least I'm, a, I'm in the door. So um, thank you very much for attending this uh, session. And I really hope, uh, wish you uh, good luck in the rest of the, uh, for those of you that still have courses uh, for the rest of this week. Otherwise, I'm really happy that uh, for those of you that have had courses week one and two, uh, that you're tuning back in. And uh, we hope to see you, well, either physically, uh, again, at, uh, at, at a hopefully future date, but otherwise, um, in the, maybe in the virtual method school again. So let's give a big hand to our, uh, virtually, our, <laughs> our uh, three panelists. And thank you for sharing your insights. Thank you. No, well, let's see if I can, ah, there we go. Oh, you're muted. Sorry, did you, did you notice Gabor smoking? Yeah. <laughs>